Hallelujah. So we're going to get to this word right now. How many are ready for the word, from a word from the Lord? Amen. Come on, let's get into it. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst here at Proof Church. I thank you for every person that Proof Church is their home, and I thank you for every person that this is their first time here. We pray, dear God, your blessing and your anointing on this message. We pray, dear God, that you not only anoint us to speak, but anoint us to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Come on, let's do this thing. So last week we started a series called Birth from the Pain of Death. Uh, I did not know that my mom was going to be at her end when the title came, um, but it just, it just all worked out <laughs> the way God works. And um, so the title of the series is called Birth from the Pain of Death. And the, the title, though, of the message for this week, I would call it The Battle Before the Cross. The Battle Before the Cross. Last week, as we spoke about the journey or the journey of Christ on the cross, I'm kind of going backwards a little bit because I wanted to give you what I spoke a little bit about last year and then bring you forward into what I believe God is calling us to speak about for this year. Because the thing about the cross and the thing about the message about the cross, you cannot isolate it to a one-moment situation. And, and I am not the one that wants to do plays like I grew up and everybody's singing down the Via Dolorosa and there's a bloody Jesus coming down and then they put a horrible cross and it's kind of crooked on the altar, you know, because we didn't do a good job at doing it. And, and, and I, just, I just don't want, Pastor Chris, hey guys, I'm sorry. Hello, I didn't see you. God bless you. I want to give honor to you. God bless you guys. Sorry. Um, and so it, they're pastors and I wanted to say greet them. I'm sorry. Um, and so, so I just, I don't, I don't like, I grew up with all of that. And then La Siete Palabra, right? The seven final words of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but they wanted to do it on a Friday. And then everybody that hadn't preached all year had an opportunity to preach that year. And they only had 10 minutes, but each one wanted to take 35 to 45 minutes because that was their moment. Because they may not get it the rest of the year. And usually they were all whack. And we had to sit there. And then your parents tell you to stay awake. Oh, it was gruesome. It was bad. It was bad. Especially, again, I'm sorry. That's for the people that, broke, that woke, woke up every Friday on, on an Easter resurrection weekend and we're in a Pentecostal church, you know? So, and, and, and so for me, as I keep learning about the cross and I keep learning about the life of Christ and just the way to the cross, there were so many opportunities of redemption that we don't focus on it. I get the last words of Jesus, and that's great. But Jesus, the blood of Jesus started pouring out way before he got on the cross. I'm going to say that again. The blood of Jesus started being poured out way before he got on the cross. The cross was just a seal of what he had already started in Gethsemane. Oh, I'm going ahead of myself. But please understand that Jesus already started bleeding for you and for me before he got on the cross. He was already making a way out where there was no way before he got on the cross, before he got whipped, before he got sentenced, before he got judged, before he was spit at before he had already started making a way and so you know we 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 have to understand there's more to it than just a story or just a moment this is this is the essence of the good news right it, it's 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 eerily good it's, it's death and resurrection. It's beatings and life. It's, it's all of this mixed up together so that you and I can have eternal life with him. And, 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 and it may not make much sense, but if you follow me this week, I promise you it's going to make a lot of sense. And so last week we explained how historians and theologians both alike state that tradition holds that when Jesus was a teenager, there was a Jewish rebellion near the town where he lived. I'm just going to bring you all together with me. Is that okay? From last week. The Roman army crushed that specific, because there was many rebellions, but at that time it was that specific rebellion that, uh, to assure that it didn't happen again. So during that time, while Jesus was a teenager, historians have proven that there was a rebellion to rise up against the Roman Empire. And so the Roman army, again, crushed that specific rebellion to assure that it wouldn't happen again. They crucified an Israelite every 10 meters or 32.8 
feet along a road for a distance of 16 kilometers. That's 52,493 feet. That's approximately 10 miles. So for 10 miles, I want you to imagine from this school right now all the way down to from Davenport High School. From this school, from this school to Davenport High School is 10 miles. I want you to imagine that it's the distance from here to the end of Village 7 in Point Siena. I want you to imagine that from here, that's the distance from Valencia College off of 192. So from here to Valencia College going towards St. Cloud, imagine that every 32 or 33 feet, you see somebody being crucified and Jesus was a teenager watching all of this. Over 1,600 people crucified in a stretch of about 10 miles had, watch this, had to leave an incredible impression on the mind of a person. Now, I want you to imagine, like I told you guys last week, and for some of you that didn't hear it, I want you to imagine that Jesus, teenage Jesus, approximately 14, maybe 16 years old, is looking at every 10 miles. Remember, they were walking, going down the road, and as he's walking and he's looking at them, he's saying, that is my destiny. I want you to imagine that he is a teenager, though all God, yet still all man. That's what makes him deity, the perfect deity. And here he is now having to look at his destiny that one day he's going to have to hand on that cross just like everybody else but the difference is he's doing it for a purpose they're doing it for their sin he's doing it to become sin for you oh you missed that moment right there you should have been running and shouting and speaking in tongues because that is the when Jesus is looking at it he's saying I'm hanging on the cross for every single one of you that are hanging on the cross and though you should be judged for your sin I become sin so that your sin is no longer yours Uh uh-huh you get it now Do, do you you understand what's happening Jesus is looking at his future So these soldiers have probably performed so many crucifixions that it was systematic. Or in other words, it was just normal for them. It was a nasty business, but it was their job. They they probably had become accustomed to it. They had become familiar. And as an old saying says, familiarity breeds contempt. It was a... A moment in time in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35 to 36, it says, When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Now, you get the impression that it was almost no big deal to them. Just another day at work. These soldiers had become used to it. They had heard the screams. They had seen the grimaces. They had listened to the pitiful pleas for mercy. They knew what to expect. In a matter of time, the man's breathing would just become brief and irregular, and life would just slip away. Finally, the day is over for these soldiers. The soldiers would go home and eat dinner with their family And play with their kids as if they didn't just kill 1,600 people within a 10-mile arc. But in understanding his plan, his journey, his purpose, or his pain, we must understand the battle that Jesus faced before the cross. Putting that into perspective, everything that I just told you, it ended at the cross, began at the resurrection, but it was prefaced in Gethsemane. Go with me to Matthew, if you please, chapter 26, verse 36 to 46, and I'm going to read it, but I need you to follow me. Because this scripture is really important because he's, Jesus, Jesus, or Matthew, when he wrote this, he's very specific at what's happening, right? He's very specific. That's important to me. And Luke was very specific. 
It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Somebody say Gethsemane. All right. You learned, you learned some Greek. And said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Peter, James, and John. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Like, guys, this is, the pressure is so bad that I feel like I'm going to die from it. Ooh, that's powerful. Stay here. In other words, that's anxiety. Stay here and watch with me. Verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, is it, 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 if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch for me, with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42. Again, the second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father. If this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Verse 44. So he left them, went away, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Stop right there. I'm going to do my best to stick to my notes. <laughs> but as we're aware, not only was he 100% God, but he was 100% man. Again, as I said previously, that's what makes him deity. I want us today to look at the process that Jesus went through from the perspective of his humanity. From the perspective of his humanity. He goes to Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press. But he didn't go alone to the pressing. Oh God, if I could just stay there. If I could just stay there. I know preachers in this room are going, just stay right there. No, I got to go. He took friends with him. Some of us have been to Gethsemane and we ask people to come with us, not realizing that the process is just for you. <laughs> the, 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 the pressing is just for you. It's not for them. You, you think they get it. They don't, they don't get it because the hour is not for them. It's for you. I told you, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. Stay with me because I know where we're going, so I'm mad excited, you know. He then tells his friends, out of the 12, he picked three. Think about that. He picked the sons of thunder. He says, you guys that are boisterous, you guys that know me, you guys that say you love me, can you just come with me because, because the hour's coming. And, 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 and so, so he tells his friends why he brought them. He explains what's going on with him emotionally. If you notice, he didn't get spiritual yet until verse 46. Verse 45 and 46 is when he gets spiritual. But all the other times he's saying, guys, let me, let me explain to you that I am so stressed. He tells them, my soul is stressed to the point of literal death. The anxiety of what's coming, it feels like it's about to kill me. He tells them, can you just, <laughs> listen, I'm so nervous and scared for what I grew up watching is about to happen to me. My greatest fear is about to become a reality. Can y'all just, can y'all just watch him pray with me? Three times 
he asked his intercessors. Three times he asked his partners in crime, his ride or die. But there's a process for you that can't nobody be a part of. They fell asleep. Here we have Jesus turning to man to come into agreement with him while he tries to figure out how to get out of this. Jesus turned to creation to come into agreement with him because three times he goes and he says, God, the same prayer. Can you get me? Is there a way to get me out of this? See, everybody talks about the one. Ah, 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 ah. Jesus tried to convince his father. Get me, excuse my language, the hell out of this. Oh, don't get offended now because that's how y'all pray. No, 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 because see, 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 we all want to be saints until time comes when we can't be saints because we, yeah. Can you, can you imagine the hell that Jesus is going through right now that he sees what's coming, that he has to try to bargain with God because he didn't hear nothing from God? He said, fine. But if it's, since it's not my will but yours. Three times his friends fall asleep. They had no clue of the importance of the moment. They knew him as healer and deliverer, but they still didn't know him as the prophecy of salvation fulfilling itself. Jesus was being betrayed while processing what he was about to go through for humanity. Jesus was being pressed like an olive for its oil. The fight between his will and his father's will were now at hand. The devil playing with his mind. Woo, go with me. But at the same time, Jesus reminding himself why he has to go to the cross. I can imagine Jesus' mind tearing in two. His mind battling for divine clarity while seeing the same ones that would betray you coming down the road with the soldiers and the others sleeping instead of praying and watching. I want you to imagine what Jesus must have been going through. The friends that I need to back me up in prayer can't even maintain me. And the one that I gave my all to just betrayed me and coming to kill me. All of this happening, not my will, but yours. Have you ever been so alone that darkness feels as if it has a voice? Have you ever been so alone that no matter where you looked, it's as if your people are ignorant to your situation or your enemies have been done nothing better than to come after you. Have you noticed that it's almost like a trickle effect, that it's all, it turns into a wave, that it comes one attack after another attack after another attack, and just when you think you're about to take a deep breath, all of a sudden the people you thought that were with you, they're asleep at the wheel. All of a sudden you find yourself alone. Here you are, the same people that you gave money to, the same people that you blessed. All of a sudden you ain't got no money. And you say, can I have a little? They go, we broke, we broke, we ain't got nothing. Yeah, you broke because you took my money. Have you, have you ever been so alone that you taste it from the bitter cup of loneliness and it's so sour that you come and you put on a smile and nobody can discern the pain that you're going through? Have you ever been so lonely that not even your spouse can fulfill that loneliness? Have you, have you, can you imagine what Jesus is going through in Gethsemane? That he is by himself, spirit, soul, and body. The battle before the cross was not only spiritual but mental. Whew. The first drops of blood that Jesus dropped was for your sanity. <laughs> the devil isn't just after your spirit, but he's after your sanity. Because if he can have your sanity, then he can have your identity. 
He can have your purpose and he can use it as use you as a puppet. Jesus battled so much that he began to sweat blood. As it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, blood begins to pour out of his pores. He begins to be so stressed that his body had something called, a medical term called hemotidrosis. It's a condition in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood, occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. It is a literal medical circumstance or situation that his own body couldn't take what was coming. Just thinking about the possibility of destruction. Just thinking about the nails in his hands. Just thinking about the nails in his feet. Just thinking about the crown of thorns. Just thinking about the whipping so that you can have eternal life and be healed in your physical body. Just thinking about the judgment that he was about to go through. He is in the oil press called Gethsemane being squeezed by God the Father and purpose and destiny all at the same time so that you and I can have sanity of mind. I find it amazing that Jesus was releasing blood before he ever went to the cross. I'm about to end. When the scripture speaks of his blood, it speaks from a cleaning perspective. As I keep looking in scripture, I realized his blood cleansed us of all sin. But it didn't start at the cross. It started in Gethsemane and ended at the cross. The first place he shed his blood was for our sanity and our mind. He knew that the devil was after your mind, so he... He shed blood for your mind first. Do you know that where you give up is in your mind, not in your spirit? So God said, I've got to deal with your mind first so I can get to your spirit. See, some of you don't realize that God was going after your intellect as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because some of you are overthinker. You're the overthinkers. And God is saying, I got to deal with your mind to get to your spirit. Some people think God gets to your spirit. No, God's got to get through the mess and the web that you have in your mind so he can make sense in your spirit. Because your mind keeps attacking you. The devil ain't coming after your spirit. He's coming after your mind. That's why he says, let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. That's why he says, you got to renew your mind in the word daily. Why? Because the battle is not in your spirit. The battle is in your mind. You give up in your mind. You let go of God in your mind. You have lack of faith in your mind. Your spirit is the breath of God, but your soul is under attack. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. And God said, I got to deal with your mind first. Your addiction is in your mind, in your frontal lobe. Your bondage is in your mind. Everything you have is in your mind. The reason you're doing what you're doing, because it's in your mind. The reason you're watching what you're watching, because it's in your mind. And the devil attacks your mind. But Jesus came to Gethsemane. He knew the devil wanted your mind. So he gave you back your sanity. Just when you thought it was over, he gave you power in Gethsemane. <laughs> he gave you, he put you in a place called the oil press. He says, I'll be pressed for you. There's a process in life that you and I should have gone through. But he went to get 70 the oil press just for you and for me. Oh my God, oh my God, do you understand? I want you to put your hand on your head and say, I plead the blood. I plead the, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. When your children are going crazy, I plead the blood. Oh, when your spouse is off with somebody else, I plead the blood. When the sickness of death comes knocking, I plead the blood. When you feel like you're about to lose your mind, I plead the blood. When all hell is breaking loose, I plead the blood. When I don't know how to pay my bills, I plead the blood. Oh, when my mind starts running and I can't get no rest. I don't know about you, but I've had some restless nights. But I learned to put my hand on my head and I plead the blood. I plead the blood over my mind because Gethsemane paid it for me. Before I even got on the cross, he paid it for me. Before he got whipped, he paid it for me. I plead the blood. I need the blood to cover my mind as well as erase my sins. There's an old song that says, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon that cross. 
I know it was the blood for me. Do you understand that it's the blood that's perfect? It's his blood that he gave so that you and I not only can have eternal life, but that we can be with him forever. See, this generation doesn't understand nothing about the blood. In the Greek, the blood means the seed of life. In other words, he gave up his seed so that you can sit in heavenly places. This generation don't understand the blood. We stop preaching about the holiness of the blood of Jesus. We stop preaching about sanctification and that it's through the blood of Jesus that you have access to the throne of grace that produces the mercy of God. That judgment doesn't even fall on you. Somebody say, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Just like they did on Passover day when the angel of death was coming and you had to put the, uh, the blood over the doorpost of your house. I plead the blood over my house and the angel of death has to go over. I plead the blood over my children. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Yo declaro la sangre de Cristo. I plead the blood. When I don't know what else to say, I plead the blood. Woo! I plead the blood. He shed his blood for your mind as well as your soul. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes. It washes white as snow. It's the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, the song says, and it will what? Never. Loose its power for it reaches to the highest woo, mountain and it flows through the lowest valleys. All the blood, all the blood, it's the blood. I know you feel at times your mind wants to run away, but I plead the blood. I know some of you may fight with anxiety, but I plead the blood. I know that you may be in the middle of a divorce, but I plead the blood. Oh, I know you're about to lose your job, but I, I plead the blood. I, I know that people left you, but I plead the blood. I, I know ain't no money coming in, but I, Oh my God, I feel like I want to go crazy. I, want, I plead the blood. I know, I know, I know your children going a little crazy and they're, and they're veering a little off. But I know, I know, I know your boss is acting a little crazy, but I, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I know you feel like giving up on yourself, but I plead the blood. I know when you look at yourself in the mirror, you keep saying, I'm going to keep falling. Oh, but that's okay. His grace is sufficient for you. I plead the blood. How many more times am I going to keep falling into the same thing? That's all right. I plead the blood. I said, I plead the blood. I said, I plead the blood. 